So first off, just a quick intro. So uh, I'm Andrew, uh, Collective on Twitter, if people want to find me or, or chat at any point. Freya is a project which uh, I sort of kicked off with Ryan Riley uh, sort of last year at some point. Um, obviously, it's open source, F-sharp friendly, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we kind of built this out of the bones of a few other bits and pieces. So sort of Ryan had a few sort of projects which he built. Uh, things like Fracture and Differig and various other bits and pieces for working with sort of web stacks and, and web programming in F-sharp. Um, I had a few as well, sort of Frost and other bits and pieces to try and explore some more interesting ways of, of building sort of web tech in, uh, in F-sharp than, uh, than just working with sort of web API or anything like that. Um, and we sort of eventually sort of had various sort of late night chats and various things and decided to sort of merge things together and try and actually sort of pull things into, into one place. Uh, try and get sort of the F-sharp community having not too many kind of fractured options to do sort of web programming, which wasn't sort of Microsoft-centric in that kind of sense. Um, so Freya sits on top of, of Owen, uh, which is sort of the fairly sort of open standard for sort of working uh, sort of between uh, sort of web servers and, and web frameworks. Um, I'll sort of talk a little bit more about that in a minute. It's something which things like Web API kind of hide a lot but uh, Freya doesn't really hide that very much. It's actually kind of useful to understand what that's doing uh, and why. Uh, so I'll come on to that in a moment. There's also a why about sort of why I actually bothered writing Freya, and it was very much one of those kind of personal itch scratching things. So I actually had a sort of corporate project, sort of a, a company which I was starting, which uh, had a very sort of heavy requirement for really accurate sort of HTTP APIs. Um, I still haven't actually got around to launching that company because I spent the whole time writing libraries to support launching that company. Um, I, I've tried to sort of stop yak shaving as much as possible, but this one's turned out to be enormous and hairy. So it's, uh, it's, it's still going. I, I will eventually launch the company that this was actually meant to do, but for now I'm sort of having more fun going and playing with this and talking about it. Um, we do get asked sort of, you know, why actually bother to use this as opposed to sort of the things which are already out there, things like Web API. Um, it's just a different vibe. It's a different feeling. Um, so the Web API, you could probably do most of the things that you might want to do, but you're going to do them in potentially quite a painful way, especially if you want to do things in a very F-sharp way, uh, if you want to do things with a little bit more accuracy, a little bit sort of closer to the metal in terms of actually understanding what HTTP is doing, and you want a bit more control over what you're doing, then Freya is probably kind of a good bet. It's also a good bet if you want to actually start creating your own abstractions. So API, Web API gives you a very MVC-ish type view of the world, uh, a very kind of, you know, sort of your, your classes and objects are controllers. And if you don't want to do this, then you're kind of out of luck. Um, if you want to build your own abstractions, if you've got your own problems and you want to come up with an abstraction which suits you better, then something like Web API isn't going to let you. Uh, Freya hopefully will. So what we're going to try and cover is just a quick sort of intro to Freya, so a little bit of sort of background in terms of how it works, how to think about it when using it, just sort of the very basics of the programming model. We can do that in the first half, hopefully take about sort of 50, 55 minutes, something like that, including me rambling now. Uh, and then we're going to have a quick break, QA, if anyone wants to ask any questions, uh, go for it then. As there's not that many of us, um, I think it's probably one of those sorts of things where we could quite happily just sort of take questions. If people want to ask questions, shout out things as we're going, I'd be more than happy if people want to do that. Um, I think it's definitely one of those sorts of things where I'm, I'm well aware that the documentation for Freya is kind of missing to non-existent in a lot of places right now. I was hoping to spend a lot of the flight over here actually writing some of that stuff, but British Airways thwarted that idea. Um, Given that sort of, you know, it's, it's very, I think, valid to sort of shout out questions and we'll probably all learn from, from things like that. I think there's definitely the sort of case that if you're thinking it, if you're wondering what the hell's going on, you almost certainly aren't the only one. Um, apologies if I am too, um, but we'll, we'll see how we go. The second half of this will work uh, on a quick sort of actual, let's implement something. We're going to use the to-do backend project, which is a kind of uh, sort of comparison site. This to-do MVC was one of those projects which people started doing to compare front-end frameworks. So people were writing the sort of the same little app in Backbone and React and all that kind of thing. So you can get a feel for for what those things look like. To-do backend is exactly sort of the same, but on on the back end on the server side, uh, people have written sort of implementations of that in all kinds of languages across all kinds of platforms. We're going to do a tiny little one in Freya. 
So if you've got the, the code sort of down, the way that this is going to work in sort of working through the, the exercises is basically just to uh, sort of set a startup project as we're going, really. So if we're doing sort of exercise zero or exercise one or anything else, uh, feel free to just you know, set that as a startup project, run it. Everything should run. Uh, everything should be sort of accessible in the browser. Everything should be firing up on localhost 8080. Um, and you should be able to see things actually happening as we go. Um, but we'll, we'll see how well that works. Uh, a quick apology as well. The, uh, the projector and the, the slides and Visual Studio and Windows don't play wonderfully nicely. So I'm going to be sort of slightly sort of schizophrenically skipping around between things. And that thing is going to go off and go flickery. And so I apologize when that's kind of annoying. There will be points in this where I forget to press detect displays. And that's blank. And I'm talking and you're just staring at me sort of angrily. Um, be nice to me when that happens, because it's, it's not going to be good for any of us. Uh, hopefully, it won't happen too much. I'll actually remember what's going on. So Freya is actually a whole bunch of libraries rather than one sort of single monolithic stack. It's designed to be one of those sorts of bits of software where you can say, right, I like this bit. I don't like this bit. I want to replace this. I want to throw this away. I like this kind of level of abstraction. I don't like this one. Um, it's very stack-like in the sense that it starts with a very low level sort of minor abstraction and then tries to build on top of that. The abstraction kind of levels which we're going to be going up to today are not the top level. Uh, there are sort of new and more abstract things coming, and you might want to build your own levels of abstraction on there. Uh, it's very much about creating a platform which it's easy to build the right abstractions for you rather than you know, the abstractions that Microsoft or somewhere else decided to give you. Um, quite a lot of the uh, sort of Freya stack was inspired by sort of other languages, other communities. Um, obviously, sort of the, the ASP.NET sort of MVC kind of world and the MVC movement got sort of inspired by various things. Obviously, you could go small talk, blah, 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 but probably more Rails, Ruby Envy. This kind of stuff happened quite a bit. Um, Freya looked around a bit more of the functional language space, so we take a lot of ideas from things like Clojure, Erlang, Haskell, other bits and pieces. Just a quickie on, on Owen, just so people actually sort of get a feeling for, for the underlying sort of tech underneath Freya. Um, who's actually sort of used to Owen, familiar with Owen as a standard, how it works, that kind of thing? Anyone? OK, that's good. I didn't waste my time actually writing anything else. So one thing which is worth pulling up if you've got a browser handy is to head over to owen.org. Um, Owen, as I say, is a community-driven standard. It's very much about uh, providing a very low-level kind of abstract interface for how sort of web servers that sort of implement the Owen standard can interface with web frameworks or sort of web apps on top of them. Um, it's really very simple. It's very lowest common denominator. Um, it's pretty ugly, but it does kind of work. It's, it's kind of similar to something like Rack in Ruby or various other bits and pieces. It's a low-level interface between sort of the unfortunate moving parts. Um, so if you're on the owen.org site, probably going over to sort of specification at the top and then finding the uh, owen 1.0 doc might be handy in a little bit. So the actual sort of owen interface is just this horrible looking funk. Um, so basically sort of owen says, OK, the server is going to give you or going to expect from you a funk which takes an ID dictionary of string to obj, which is glorious. Uh, and returns a task, not even a generic task, just a task. So say when you're done kind of task. Um, it's, it's not brilliant. That's really not the most elegant thing in the world. But obviously, it has to work from any kind of .NET CLR type language. Um, so we can't have anything pretty like sort of async stuff or, or nice kind of generics or even a nice type system. And you know, not even really a nice kind of object system in terms of the data that comes in. So this iDictionary string to obj is where all of the request and response and context data is held. Um, and it's just a big mutable dictionary of state, which from the F sharp side of things doesn't make us feel particularly warm and fuzzy, but it is, it is what it is, really. So it does work. You can plug all sorts of things into this, but it, it happens with a bit of ugliness. But it's worth understanding what's going on under the hood. So exercise zero is going to be something which we have a quick play with this one. If you've got exercise zero open in some sort of IDE, I'm going to assume Visual Studio for now, but something or other, um, fire it up and program.fs is what you're going to want. Um, so you're going to see in there, I'm just going to sort of flip between things over here so that I can actually see what you're seeing in a moment. 
Uh, you're going to see in there a function, which is kind of something like hello world. Uh, and that's going to be that nasty, raw kind of Owen funk of iDictionary to stuff. There's a parameter in there, which is, which is env. Uh, it's going to quite accurately tell us that we're not even using env at the moment because we've done nothing with it. If you fire that program up right now and actually hit localhost 8080, you will get a blank response. It'll be 200 OK. It just won't have anything in it. It'll be very, very boring. Um, what we're going to want to do now is having a look at that owen.org spec document, which I talked about just a moment. Uh, and let's modify that env to actually write some stuff. So we're going to be mutating that dictionary horribly uh, where everyone can see it. That's a shame. Um, but we're going to, let's take sort of three minutes and see whether we can actually make that say, hello world. Maybe set something like a, uh, you know, a response code, a response status, anything you like. Somewhere down in there in the, uh, the response data keys, 3.2.2 in that doc should be enough information to get going. And we don't need to be particularly clever about sort of actually just doing anything nice with our task. It's just kind of fine to mutate that thing in place. Hopefully that's making sense to people. But uh, do shout out if I'm making no sense whatsoever. I'm just going to have a quick glance at the code as well. So those of you that have scrolled down might notice my deliberate mistake from last night when I was committing stuff, which was leaving my notes on the solution in place. I have not done that in the other ones, but you have already got the solutions in the solutions folder in here. So it depends how uh, sort of honest you want to be. I can't exactly flunk people for this, so it's kind of it is more about kind of getting a feel for what's actually happening under the hood so we don't sort of run into weirdness later. Has everyone kind of made something work, see something vaguely happening? So if you haven't already, feel free to have a look at Solution Zero, um, which is pretty much, I would hope, going to look like what you wrote, uh, or at least something like what you wrote. Um, if it didn't, shout. If, uh, if what you wrote sort of did look something like that, and it compiled and ran, and you got Hello World back, then that's great. So does the sort of solution to that make sense to people? Do shout if the answer is no to that one, because otherwise this is going to get really awkward very quickly. I didn't actually check as well uh, sort of whether everyone here actually had some F sharp experience, which is probably something which I should have done earlier. If you came in expecting sort of intro to F sharp, that might be slightly more awkward. I'm guessing everyone's actually written a, re a reasonable amount of F sharp here. If not, give me a shout and I'll, yeah. OK, cool. Oh, OK. Well, yeah. All right. If, if you got the OCaml experience, it's not going to come as a massive shock. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That yeah. was my hope. Yeah. I, I think it, it should be OK. I think when we start seeing things like the computation expressions, I'm not sure there's an obvious equivalent. Um, but it should be pretty obvious anyway, I think. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, there's, there's enough to kind of demo code and solutions and the rest of it in here that you're not going to get wildly lost. Hopefully, it'll make sense to you. OK, so let's. Uh, we got that sort of XI0 working, hopefully speaking, and we got a hello world back. But it was pretty nasty, I think. Um, didn't really want to do that all the time. You could do, of course, but you probably don't want to. So Freya.core uh, and the Freya core library is our sort of first level of abstraction. It gives us a little bit over this. Uh, what it mainly gives us in an F-sharp sense is a Freya computation expression. And that actually just wraps up that kind of state, that environment dictionary, and all the rest of it in something where you don't need to see it. So we can keep all of our nasty mutation away where you know, children can't find it and we don't upset the F sharp community. Um, unfortunately, we have to do it under the hood, but we can at least make it slightly more palatable by making that sort of a slightly more functional approach. Um, so we have the uh, Freya.core library and the Freya namespace, which has a uh, Freya module, which has a bunch of useful functions for working with it. Um, so that sort of Freya computation expression is actually, and I'm sorry to use the M word, but it's basically an async state kind of monad. 
sorry, I had to, it, it's just kind of, you can't really avoid talking about them forever. Um, don't worry too much. If you hate monads, any kind of discussion of types, category theory, all the rest of it, you might have come to the wrong conference, but don't worry about it in this talk. Um, so let's change that over. So if you open up exercise one, uh, rather than using that sort of raw kind of Owen kind of stuff, we'll start to use the Freya stuff. So fire up exercise one, and let's see what it looks like with the very basic level of Freya. It's not a great deal different. So what we should see, at least in exercise one, I've created a little bit of scaffold. Um, we'll see that a couple of things have changed. So hello world is now an empty Freya function. Uh, and the, uh, the exercise function down below, which is where we're wiring this up to, uh, to Katana, which is the Owen server we're using, uh, now actually has uh, Owen at func of Freya rather than just passing that hello world function directly. All that's basically doing is taking our computation expression and turning it into that nasty func signature, uh, sort of wrapping it in a little bit of sort of unpleasantness. Um, you'll see that kind of thing around, so sort of converting computation expressions into other forms. Uh, sort of compiling or sort of reifying them, if you like. Um, for this exercise, all we really need to do is just grab the environment state out of our Freya expression because we're going to be doing basically the same thing again. So it's still less pleasant than it should be, but at least we begin to see, right, okay, so this, this Freya computation expression is just basically wrapping that state somewhere underneath it. We'll stop playing around with it directly in a minute, but it's kind of useful to see. So we've only got kind of a minute or so to, to go with this one. X minutes according to my slide. Not quite sure how that happened, but still. Pretty sure I only said about two minutes for this one. It's not wildly interesting, especially when you've just done the previous one. So if you want to open up solution one whenever you feel like you kind of get where we're going with this, feel free you will see something which is obvious and still quite horrific, but uh, is at least a little bit less sort of funks and C-sharp types and casts of other things. So you'll notice from that that the, uh, the environment isn't the only thing we actually hold in the state. Uh, we actually use the state to hold a bunch of other sort of useful things as well, like sort of memoizations of data and various bits and pieces, or sort of fray optimizations, things that we don't want to pollute sort of our own session with, things that no one else cares about, we can stick in other parts of our state. You very rarely need to sort of fiddle with that directly, but if you do, that's, it's useful to know it's there. So does that kind of make sense, that new little bit? I'm going to assume that sort of the... Uh, Lack of no's means yes, so. So let's, let's move on a little bit and see sort of exactly what we could do to make that a little bit nicer in this case. So in the next kind of exercise, we're going to look at sort of what was wrong with that in a really specific way. So we have something that works. We have something we're no longer sort of actually playing around with sort of funks and other bits and pieces, but it's still unpleasant. It's still really ugly. Um, and. and the worst thing about this is that it's actually really unsafe. So we're, we're mucking about with a dictionary of string to obj, and we're just kind of throwing data in there, and I could write whatever I wanted to the stream, or I could set the header to be an image, or I could do whatever the heck I wanted with it. Um, so I've got no kind of guarantee that anything I'm doing with this is valid HTTP in any sense whatsoever. Anything I chuck into that dictionary, I'm going to send back to it and say, hey, do something with this. And it may or may not. It might blow my server up. It might do anything, but it certainly gives me no guarantees about what we actually want to do with it. So what we'd actually quite like to have is a way of working with that big, ugly dictionary of, of state in a way that we can only work with the stuff we care about at any particular time. So we really want to just look at a specific sort of nested element within that data structure. And it'd be great if we could do that in a way which actually lets us use this as types rather than just strings or ints or random other uh, sort of potentially fail-worthy kind of stuff. So the way that Freya does this is with lenses. Um, the Haskell 
sort of uh, team somewhere down the corridor will probably be uh, cheering at this point. But um, the F sharp community doesn't sort of use lenses a great deal that I've found. Um, quick kind of show of hands, show of nods, etc. Who's familiar with sort of lenses and sort of using lenses in FP? Not. Okay, cool. That's just as well. I suspected that that was probably going to be the case. Um, so lenses are a sort of fairly useful functional technique for working with complex data structures. Um, if we've got something like a big nested sort of tree of data or you know, a big bunch of records containing dictionaries, containing maps, containing all this kind of stuff, a lot of time, obviously, because we've got this immutable data structures, if we want to change something, which is just a little piece of data sort of way down in that data sort of structure, um, that's really awkward. We're going to have, you know, even if it's just sort of records, you know, sort of with, 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 kind of all these changes cascading through our data. Uh, and the code to do something, which is probably just, you know, I just want to increment this int, is a huge amount of code just to sort of go and grab that piece of data and put it back into this immutable data structure. And it's ugly. And it's really verbose and it's a pain. Um, so what a lens does is let us actually work with just a small piece of that data structure. So I've always wanted to do a whiteboard thing. This is going to take a very, very small amount of time, but it's kind of useful. If we had you know, some big kind of data structure which had inside it a load of other stuff, each of which had inside it a load of other stuff and some smaller things, and actually the only thing that we care about is that one. Uh, and in most immutable languages, sort of actually dealing with just this, you know, I, I want to apply a function to this value, is, is a nuisance. I've got to go and grab that. I've got to modify it. I've got to kind of recreate this whole outside data structure and get that back. And so I've got a new instance of this whole outside thing. Um, and that's going to be a nuisance. What lenses do is basically we can say, right, a lens is, in F sharp at least, you know, a function or a pair of functions which lets us get this and lets us set this, and then a library to let us work with that in a way which this whole outside thing is invisible. So I can just work at the level I care about. The other cool thing about lenses is that they're composable. So if I've got a lens which gets me to here, and I've got a lens which gets me from here to here, if I compose those, I've got a lens which gets me all the way in. So if I write sort of lots of small lenses, I can add them together and get deeper into my structure, or I can do other bits and pieces which are useful. Um, what you can also do with lenses is convert between the type of things you've got as you go between these representations. So if I've got something in here which is just a string, if I write a lens which turns that into some typed representation on the way in uh, and writes it back as a string on the way out, I can work with that as my typed representation transparently while actually modifying the underlying string from the point of view of you know, the compiled representation. So that's kind of you know, a lens plus a morphism can actually mean, OK, I can dive way down into my data structure, see it as strongly typed, modify just that thing, um, while actually modifying a big, ugly ball of strings in the middle. So there is a little lens library which I wrote for F Sharp called Ether, which uh, uses sort of these techniques. Um, and we're going to see what that looks like now. So we're going to start using lenses into that environment rather than modifying that environment directly. So there's some interesting functions which Freya provides. So if you fire up exercise two at this point, um, you're going to want uh, some functions like Freya.setLensPartial. That's going to take uh, a lens, and you're also going to take the value that you want to set, whatever that lens is pointing to. So there's a reason why we've got Freya.setLens and Freya.setLensPartial. So some lenses are what are called total lenses. Um, essentially, that's where you know that the data you're getting is going to exist. Um, so that sort of it'll always get you a piece of data. It'll always set a piece of data. If you've got a data structure where the data you're looking for may not exist, uh, then what it's going to return is an option of that data. It's going to return sort of maybe that data. Um, you can always set that data, but you can't necessarily always get that data. So we've got a partial lens. There are quite a lot of things in HTTP and in Freya where that's the case, because especially when we're dealing with uh, things like uh, sort of response values or headers or all the rest of it. Most of these things are optional. So we often find that we're working with sort of partial sort of lenses in, into some of these data structures. But what we should be able to see, if you sort of uh, go with sort of do sort of Freya.setLensPartial and then something like response.statusCode or response.reasonPhrase, you should find that that actually asks you for some data afterwards if that kind of makes sense. Have you suggested just look at the solution and uh, 
Yeah, if, if, if feel free to go for that if you want to do it. It's uh, it might be sort of a, a useful thing to uh, to do, especially when we're looking at some of the things like the uh, sort of this. It's a bit of a jump into this kind of piece of code. So uh, feel free to look at the solution and see if you can sort of work out what that's doing, see whether that makes sense. Are all of the, the data dot methods going to be like one out of bind? And they basically are, yeah. So we're, we're generally working sort of within this kind of Freya computation expression, which is, as you say, it's, it's a monadic kind of context. So most of the methods that we're seeing here are actually working against that kind of monadic state. They're working against the, uh, so the async state that we have. Uh, in this case, there's you know sort of actually working with that state with, with lenses. There are other things in there that we can do. We'll see some uh, some other worlds later on as well. But uh, this is actually a really common kind of pattern in the Freya sort of approach. So if we go and fire up solution two, it's still moderately verbose, but what it is is a lot more accurate and a lot more type safe. So where we've got that response.scatus code and the response reason phrase, and where we're actually working with sort of mapping things over the response body, uh, we've gone from having this kind of world where we're working with objects to a world where that's actually strongly typed. So the only thing that I can set the status code to is an int, or the only thing that I can set the status or the reason phrase to is a string. Uh, if we go and sort of type, if you try something like changing response.status code to response.headers.age, let's say, if anyone wants to try that one, you'll find that 200 is now not valid because it's actually expecting a, an age type. Uh, and we have a very strong type system around HTTP in Freya. So there's no way of actually sort of pumping H, sort of invalid HTTP into a Freya response if you use the typed lens system. So we put quite a lot of effort into making sort of invalid states unrepresentable, sort of non-compilable. Um, sort of Freya will, if you use it sort of in a reasonably sane way, uh, and you sort of avoid diving down into sort of directly mutating the state sort of in the environment, it will keep you pretty safe in terms of making sure that everything you actually send it is, uh, is a valid piece of data and that the HTTP you're writing is actually going to be correct. Could that point one last, one more time on the age headers? Yeah. So my response dot headers is capital H. Yes. I don't have a setter for set H, is that what you're saying? Uh, if you have, uh, so I'll, I'll just pull this up on screen and we'll, uh, we'll share this for a moment. So, okay, so I'll just take that back to where we were. So if we had our response.status uh, code, can people see that roughly OK? Cool. So that top line where we're looking at setting the response status code, uh, response.status code is a lens. Uh, and it's a lens into that environment state, which is actually sort of diving down into this nest of dictionaries uh, and then mapping that string type to, in this case, an int. It's quite simple. Um, the only thing that I can put there is an int. So if I want to change that to something else, if I were to change that to uh, string, uh, it's going to say, no, that's, that's not cool. Uh, you know, the only thing that you can set the status code to is an int. Uh, if I wanted to change that to something like uh, response.headers uh, and then dot .age, uh, it's now going to ask me for something else. It's going to say that a string is still not valid, but it's expecting an age type. So that actually would have to be something like uh, time span, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to be accurate about what we're doing. Uh, and all of the representations of data that you can put in Freya are really strongly typed. We actually have a complete type system over HTTP 1.1. Does that make some sort of sense to people? It's sort of the... Uh, Sort of take take us sort of on faith the uh, the set lens and the set lens partials and this kind of stuff. There are obviously equivalents for sort of getting that data out and for, for mapping that. Um, it is basically get set and map, which is what the usual sort of things you want to do with lenses. Um, but that will uh, will let us actually work with pretty much everything in a web request in a strongly typed way. This is the exciting bit where I actually try and go back to uh, projecting things.
Does that make some kind of sense so far in terms of what we're actually sort of starting to do in terms of working with sort of Owen data, but in a, a rather more strongly typed functional way? Cool. So the next kind of thing is obviously we, we have a response coming in. We're, we're, we're handling our hello world quite nicely. Um, it's strongly typed. It's, it's working quite well. We can be pretty sure that this is actually safe, um, but we don't have any actual sort of routing or anything useful happening here. So the next thing we're going to do is actually sort of wire this up so we can actually have more than one response. That's probably going to be useful in any kind of real world app. So before we do that, there's just a quick other sort of bits to go through, which is we have this concept of a pipeline. Um, so a lot of Freya is designed to be really sort of heavily composable. Um, if you write sort of lots of small functions, you can wire them together, you can sequence them, you can, uh, you can call them from, from each other. Um, but one of the things which sort of the, the high level sort of composition method is this concept of a Freya pipeline. So if you have a Freya function which returns either next or halt, you can chain those together in such a way that uh, you'll run through that chain until it reaches a halt. Uh, and that's kind of useful. So a lot of the things that we, that we have uh, are actually pipelines and we can compose pipelines together in a much more sensible way and we can express sort of, you know, what's actually going to happen. Uh, so when we're writing things like routers, we can expect that the router's going to hold if it actually matched a route and that kind of thing. So much like we had our sort of Freya computation expression, uh, Freya router provides a Freya router computation expression, uh, which has you know, a few custom keywords and takes some other strongly typed bits of data to define how you're actually going to wire up uh, you know, these, these functions we've been writing, which can actually respond to an HTTP request. Uh, and how we're actually going to map those to different URIs, how we're going to actually start putting the data out and, and doing that kind of thing. So we have a, a root keyword in that kind of Freya router. If you want to fire up exercise three, this might sort of start to make a little bit more sense. Uh, I've already wired one up. Uh, so I've wired up our existing kind of hello world kind of uh, function, and I've wired it up to a root. Uh, and you'll notice again that sort of pretty much everything in here is actually strongly typed. We don't have any strings particularly anywhere. The only string in there is we're actually parsing into a URI template. Uh, we actually use a strongly typed URI template for, for routing and for various other things, for generating URIs and other parts of the framework. So we can uh, always guarantee that sort of the, the routes that we have are you know, strongly typed. The data that sort of comes out of those is, is predictable and we can actually pass those around as values rather than uh, just sort of relying on people getting the right strings in places. So we have a sort of kind of world where we can match on particular methods. In this case, we're just going to match on any HTTP method or any HTTP verb. Uh, so we're just going to say we're going to match all methods with uh, slash hello, uh, and we're going to use our hello world function for that. So the next really quick, very, very simple exercise is just to create the equivalent for this. Uh, so, you know, we've got a hello world. Let's create a quick goodbye world function uh, and wire that up in the same way. As I'm assuming a lot of that was probably sort of control C and control V, I'll kind of move on fairly quickly. Um, one of the things that you'll notice if you fire up solution three, obviously we've got these two functions now. Uh, we've got two routes in our router. One little thing to notice, at the end of our router, we're piping that to uh, Freya router dot to pipeline. This is kind of one of the things that I mean about we, we work with pipelines a lot. Uh, we'll notice that the, uh, the hello world and the goodbye world functions we've created as well also now return uh, Freya dot next. Uh, so those are pipeline functions as well. And that router actually expects that each of the, uh, the functions you give it to actually map a URI to is going to be a pipeline. When that router actually matches, the, uh, the result next or halt that it returns will be the, func the result of the function that it, that it matched. So if it's, uh, it's going to run hello world, it's going to return the result of hello world. And so the router is itself a pipeline. Um, that Freya router to pipeline is actually essentially compiling that computation expression. We use computation expressions quite a lot to essentially configure to the parts of our systems. We have quite a declarative model in that kind of thing. I could have a go. What kind of thing? So just generally the whole pipeline frame on next. Yeah, sure. So if we were to have sort of, you know, we write our sort of hello world function. Uh, let's call that HW somewhere over here. Uh, and that returns, let's say that returns next. Um, 
if I were to sort of then create a router and say, okay, so slash hello uh, will actually call my hello world function and goodbye, et cetera, will call my, my goodbye world function. When my router runs, uh, I'm going to map and I'm going to match the first route which actually you know, matches the, uh, the path that came in on the request, and I'm going to run this function. And I'm going to get a value back, which might be, in the case of this one, might be next, might be halt here. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to return that function as a result of running the router. So that actually sort of maps down to here. And then what I can do with any of these functions, so a router or any other type of function, is I can chain them together. And I can do that with, there's a couple of operators which we can see later on. Um, but what I can do is I can say, right, you're going to carry on running this chain of functions until one doesn't return next. So in the case of this router, I might say, okay, right, I want this function to only run uh, this hello world, and then I want it to halt. So I just make sure that hello world returns halt, and anything that comes after the router or anything else that uses hello world isn't going to happen. So I might want to say, you know, there are some headers which something else sets, but I don't want to set them all. I might put something in front of hello world, which is you know, another function which does something like security. Uh, so I might authenticate someone. I might do some authorization at that point. And I might say, OK, so that function there is going to return next if you're authenticated. It's going to return halt if you're not. So we never even run this hello world function. So we can start to chain things together in a way which actually sort of is, is useful. Does that make any sense, or is that useful? Or? Yeah, basically. Yeah, it's, it's a way to sort of lift Freya pipeline expressions into a place that they can be composed. Yeah. Okay, where are we at? Okay, so hopefully that sort of made some sense. You ended up with two routes and a router. Um, but we've got some slightly unpleasant sort of things starting to happen. We've got two functions which are basically identical. Um, that's not particularly good. And one of the things we really want to get as much as possible out of Freya is this concept of, of reuse and, and sort of breaking things down into small functions uh, and reusing them. So obviously sort of everything in Freya is just a function. You know, all of these all of these Freya functions are just parameterized functions. Um, so we can call Freya functions from within other Freya functions. We can give Freya functions arguments, and then we can obviously sort of parameterize them in that way. Um, so what we're going to try next is just saying, right, OK, let, let's take this uh, sort of common bit of functionality. It should be fairly obvious, the sort of refactorable bit from sort of hello world and goodbye world, and create a new function. Uh, call it, I don't mind too much, you know, sort of whatever you'd like to call that. Um, pull the common stuff into there. Maybe give it a parameter for the message you want to send, uh, and then sort of actually make our hello world and goodbye world functions just call that one directly. Um, because it's a computation expression, uh, it, it has the usual kind of do and let and uh, sort of return sort of bang notation available. So you should be able to call that function as you would any other kind of computation expression or sort of async type expression in, in F sharp. Feel free to, uh, to look at the uh, solution for if that's kind of useful to you. Uh, especially, I can imagine, if your main sort of world is a camel and you're not used to computation expressions, that might uh, definitely help. <laughs> so my main world is Erlang, and I was hoping for a comparison to one machine. Ah, we will get there in the second half. Yeah. <laughs> so just as a really quick sort of while other people are just doing that for a minute or two, just the, the computation expression side of things in, in F sharp is essentially just some sort of syntactical sugar over, well, what is essentially a monad. Um, you, you can write your own, as long as you write sort of a type which implements sort of, you know, sort of bind, return, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, in a specific way, uh, the computation expression syntax kind of comes for free. Uh, you can then sort of actually use this computation expression syntax with an instance of that type and say, okay, sort of let bang is bind and, and do is, is return this kind of stuff. Um, or return is return, do is actually something else. But, but um, it's, it's only just sort of syntax sugar. 
Um, and in fact, actually, sort of, I'll show you just very briefly in a few minutes that actually, sort of, you, you don't need to use the computation expression syntax in Freya if you don't want to. If you like operators and monadic syntax, that's there too. Um, but this is sort of usually a little bit easier to get started with. It's a bit more verbose, but it's a bit more understandable. So hopefully, we should have ended up with something like solution four by now. Let's go and take a look. But then luck, people ended up with something roughly akin to that kind of thing. So we pulled all of that kind of common stuff out into, uh, into a function which takes a, a message parameter and then just called that from our goodbye world and, and hello world functions. All right, so we've at least managed to get some different routes in. We're almost at the point where we could start building sane things with Freya, or admittedly at a very low level of abstraction, but we could actually start working with HTTP in a relatively safe way. And we could actually start wiring things up to uh, actually sort of start building an API or to start building something that we might want. Uh, we might not want to do it this way. It's going to be a lot of typing and a lot of work, uh, but we might at least be at a point where we could actually start to use this uh, reasonably consistently. The last kind of bit to perhaps look at is, you know, actually we're matching on roots and that kind of thing. Um, but roots tend to be a little bit more dynamic than this. We tend to have more than just some static URIs. Um, I said earlier that we used URI templates for our routing, and the reason for that is we use URI templates for matching as well. So if we have a URI template, uh, which is, you know, slash users and then an ID sort of piece of data embedded in that URI, we're going to want to be able to use that in our uh, in our code, in our data, we're going to be able to get the value of this kind of stuff that's coming out of the root. Um, and we do that with lenses again. So when we work with things like the request and the response, we've got a lens into the data, into that part of things. Uh, the router will actually write the, the data that it's matched, the data that's pulled out of the root, into the environment as well. Uh, and we have some, uh, some lenses which can, can get and set that too. Um, so in this case, rather than it being request dot so and so or response dot whatever, uh, we've got root dot whatever, and we actually sort of have a you know an RFC compliant version of the URI template system. Uh, in this case, if we've just got sort of ID or something like that in the root, then actually that's just an atom. That's just an atom piece of data rather than a list or a map or anything else, which you can technically specify as part of a URI. Um, so we'd use that lens. So sort of you know root dot atom ID. Uh, and we'd be able to pull that piece of data out of the root. Uh, that's a partial lens again, um, because you know, we might not have that piece of data in the root. Um, in this case, we kind of know that we are going to have that, because we're not going to get to uh, you know, sort of matching on this if, if, if we didn't match. Um, but let's actually try and use that. So we're going to change our, our two functions now. Uh, so we're going to change the routing uh, in exercise five, so we don't just have this kind of static hello and goodbye kind of world. We're actually going to say sort of hello name, hello someone. Um, and then we're actually going to use that piece of data in our functions. So this is where we're going to want to, uh, we've been setting data so far with a Freya.setLens partial. Uh, we're going to want to use getLens partial here so we can actually pull that, uh, that root data out of the environment. And when we do that, we're going to want to uh, sort of potentially change our functions. Uh, so it might take an extra sort of parameter for, for who to greet or for who to say hello to or, or other bits and pieces. So root.atom is going to return a string option. Um, the thing with this, and we find that this is sort of obviously quite a sort of common thing that happens with this kind of programming, is this is definitely an option type, but we know that because we did actually match on this root, it's definitely sum. Uh, so you can be kind of lazy and you can just take the value, which is icky, but it actually works fine. It's actually a safe thing to do. If you really wanted to do something a little bit nicer than that, you could actually do sort of options sort of get or default or something else. You can actually sort of get this. So if you want to be really particularly safe and make sure that there was never any chance of uh, you know, a runtime exception, you could actually just sort of pattern match on that value if you wanted to and have to supply a default name. But be aware that that case is never going to get hit anyway. So. <laughs> And again, obviously, sort of feel free to, uh, to take a look at solution five when you sort of feel like you uh, might get something from doing so.
matching name, you couldn't get uh, nothing. Yeah, so although obviously sort of the value that that brings back is an option because the, the lens can't guarantee that that value is present in the, in the root, we know that it will be in this case because you know, we'll, we'll never record this function unless we match that particular root. Um, so it's, it's actually sort of fairly safe to assume that we've got that, but if we wanted to be a little bit safer, we can pattern match over it and make sure. But uh, feel free to just use the value of that option if, if you want to, because it's going to be effectively just as safe. It's just one of those things that unfortunately without an extraordinary type system, maybe you just could get us there, maybe not. And we're never actually going to be able to sort of verify at compile time. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that we'd probably do there is actually say, right, so the, the values that you might get out of a root uh, are just the values that are valid in a URI. So they're either a string or a list of strings or a list of string pairs. What you could do is write a function which takes that string and sort of, you know, option maps it to, you know, int.parse or, or whatever you wanted to do in that kind of sense if you want to cast that to something cleverer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Atoms are always option of strings. Uh, there are three things you can get out. You can either get a list or a, 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 a list of pairs, um, because those are kind of the things that are valid within the URI template. Um, as you say, I mean, there are quite a lot of places where you're going to want to turn that into something a little bit more uh, structured, um, and we'll, we'll actually see that in the second half. We'll, we'll use that in some of the uh, the API that we build. Uh, we're going to do exactly that. All right, so hopefully people will have ended up with something along the lines of, if I actually go and find the solution to five. Obviously, in this case, we, uh, we only really care about strings as, as it goes, but uh, we, could, uh, we could, as you say, be sort of parsing those or, or sort of turning those into something a little bit more uh, strongly typed or a little bit more specifically typed if we actually had a requirement to do so. Um, we'll see that later. We could do something else here as well, of course. I mean, this, this is kind of, there are always going to be different ways to sort of decompose this kind of problem. So in this case, actually, name is exactly the same in, in both kind of places. We're doing this Freya.getLens partial in both our sort of hello and goodbye world sort of things. We could move that into message name and have that, have that over there. Um, but then, you know, it's, it just depends sort of what we think we're going to use that for later. Do we want that to be a parameter of this, or is this always going to be the same thing? Um, you often find that it sort of works out more simply to make these things you know, sort of as parameterized as possible and then just pass things around. You can always pull it out. It's pretty easy to refactor, but uh, it's, it's there if you need it. Uh, one last thing before we have a quick break and any sort of other questions if you want to ask. When I talked earlier on about, uh, you know, we've got this computation expression syntax for this kind of thing, uh, and there was a sort of really sort of quite sensible question from over there about, you know, is this actually just a monadic kind of thing with the usual sort of bind and, and all the rest of it? Yes, it is. Uh, if you like that kind of thing, uh, and sort of the F-sharp community is a little bit split on sort of how much it loves custom operators or indeed doesn't, um, you can do that quite happily if you do like those sorts of things. So you could rewrite sort of solution five uh, slightly differently if you opened up this Freya.core operators namespace. You could write it like this. If you're familiar with uh, sort of fairly common sort of monadic operators, Haskell, et cetera, et cetera, this will look quite obvious and familiar. If you're not, this might look insane. Um, but essentially, all this is doing, so if we take a look at this sort of top one, this message name, uh, these operators basically just chain together uh, monadic expressions and throw away the result of the last one. As things like Freya.setLens partial actually just return unit anyway, we don't care about the results, so we can just chain them together. Um, read name here, actually, this, this operator here uh, actually just passes the result of a, uh, of a monadic function to a normal function. Uh, and this one here just composes two monadic functions and takes the, the result of one and passes it to the input of the next. So it's a lot smaller, but it's also a little bit... Uh, less obvious to people that aren't really used to that kind of style of writing things. It's there if you want it. Uh, in some of the systems I've written with this, uh, I use sort of this style almost exclusively. 
I'm not going to do it again in this talk. It's just kind of a useful sort of, if you like this kind of thing, if you have any Haskell envy, if you are a Haskeller, if you are anyone else, you might want to uh, sort of go this direction. But the computation expression syntax will let you do absolutely everything this does, just in a slightly different way. I could also be particularly unpleasant and say that there are functions for doing things like Freya.setLens partial as well. If I wanted to, I could actually do something like, uh, I believe something like that. Yeah, there we go. So that slightly weird operator here will actually do set lens partial in this kind of world. Uh, and then I can actually just start mapping things and making this really quite small indeed. And it starts to look like just imperative code. Um, but again, sort of you, you might want to get a little bit more used to what this is actually doing before you start filling your entire screen with operators. Mm -hmm. As I say, it's, it's there if you want it. Uh, there's there's going to be documentation sort of which will walk, walk you through that and compare the two styles. Uh, most people are probably going to want to start off and stick with a computation expression style. It's a little bit more verbose, but it's also a lot sort of easier to just sort of pick up and read quickly. All right, cool. So we're about 55-ish minutes in. So uh, it's a sort of mid sort of session break. So in the second half, we're going to do an actual sort of example of building something slightly more sensible with this. Uh, and for people that are interested in the web machine approach, that's what we're going to hit in the second half. So we're going to go one more level of abstraction up and start to look at frame machine uh, and start to look at sort of how that's similar to web machine, how it goes a little bit further in some slightly insane but potentially useful ways. Uh, sorry? Typed ways, yes, it does go there in typed ways too. Yeah, so I mean, I love Erlang, but it, it, I wish it had a different type system. So, but it's um, incredibly narrow use case if you don't need it. So <laughs> well, if yeah. If you stay in functional programming and step outside of that use case, then I come to this conference. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, so we got. Let's take sort of ten minutes. Uh, grab the restrooms if anyone wants to come and ask anything. Talk about things. That'd be cool. Yeah. 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 So Owen at Funk of Freya actually doesn't care about the return type. Um, it assumes that by the time you're actually sort of turning this into something to give to a server, you've done all the stuff you want. Um, so Owen at Funk of Freya will take your return type and it will merrily throw it away and it will never look at it again. Um, so that's the sort of one place where, yes, it doesn't matter too much. It's just going to discard it. Um, it assumes that by the time you get to there, you've already done all the things you want to do with your pipelines and composition and this kind of thing. So does Freya pipeline inherit uh, with, with the Freya as a, as a unit? Um, so Freya, Freya pipeline is Freya of Freya pipeline choice. Okay. Uh, so that's that next or halt union. Okay. Um, Freya, the, the Freya function itself is just Freya of T. So whatever you return from that, you've got a Freya T. If you return a Freya pipeline choice, you are sort of implicitly a Freya pipeline. And then you can start using anything which expects a Freya pipeline, which is quite a lot of things. Uh, but we'll see that a bit more as we go through. Um, like like yeah, so I mean, we've, we've done some experiments with things like quotations um, with, with type providers around generated <laughs> aspects over this. The kind of the underlying problem is that sort of the, the data you've got is so woolly underneath, um, sort of that the dictionary and other bits and pieces are are awkward to work with. Um, you could probably add an extra layer of sugar on top of things like Freya.setLens and this kind of thing. Uh, you could probably also write a new computation expression, which actually sort of gave you some of that stuff as keywords or, or custom expressions, that kind of thing. Um, it's it's out there if if you know as a, as a potential way to do that. Uh, at the moment, it's sort of one of those which is hard hard to make it add a lot of value. Um, and obviously, sort of it's finding that right balance between sort of being sort of verbose and explicit, uh, and also sort of reasonably concise. 
Um, the, the thing with this is that, you know, as you actually see, so if you don't end up spending that much time actually doing things like Freya.setLens, et cetera, et cetera, when you start to look at the high levels of abstraction. Quite a lot of what we've done in the first half is essentially sort of the tools you use to build different abstractions. Uh, so we're going to work through sort of our sort of most common abstraction in the second half. Um, but sort of from a day-to-day -day perspective, if you're regularly doing things like actually setting headers manually and this kind of thing, um, then you're probably working at too low a level. Um, you know, so it's time to write another layer on top kind of thing. Um, so, so one of the things that sort of Freya is quite good for is sort of building up new abstractions out of smaller chunks. Yeah. Uh, can you review what computation expressions are in F sharp? Yeah. No, that's cool. So let's trying to see what, what a good kind of way of, of doing this is. Um, so a computation expression is basically sort of a, a syntax feature in F sharp um, where you can write this kind of curly bracket kind of syntax. So the most common one that people will see is, is async. Yeah. Uh, what that's doing behind the scenes is actually saying, right, whenever you write something like let bang equals so and so or do bang, etc., it's actually applying a function to that before it does that thing. So the async, for example, will take your expression, it will wrap it in an async return or that kind of thing. It's a way of sort of actually sort of modifying your functions or your expressions before you run them. Um, in this kind of world, what we're actually doing is we're saying, right, each of your functions is going to have an implicit sort of second argument, which is the state or something like that. Um, so it's a way of wrapping up and sort of tidying away, sort of threading some kind of context through this expression. So in the async world, it's not actually sort of sending anything through, but it's wrapping everything in asyncs, or async.run, or async task, or, or whatever. Um, in this world, it's sort of saying, OK, everything gets an extra state. Um, there are other ways of doing that kind of thing. Um, we'll see one later on, which is actually a JSON computation expression. What that's actually doing is saying, right, the sort of implicitly what you're working with is some JSON object, which is the state, which is the environment. So any sort of function that you run in the JSON expression is going to be a sort of implicitly applied to this JSON object. Yeah. Um, this is why when you do like create a set lens partial, yeah. you weren't ever actually specifying the thing you were setting the yeah. on. Yeah, that's the thing. So that, that Freya expression implicitly has within it the state that we're working with. Um, so whenever we actually do something in there, we've, we've, we've got access to that state. Um, you know, if we actually, very briefly, let's see if I can uh, find some. 